Kwame Krumah, a prominent figure in the struggle for African independence and the first president of Ghana, was born on September 21, 1909 in Crowfell, Gold Coast, now Ghana. Raised by his mother and extended family in the village of Nkrofel, Kwame enjoyed a carefree childhood, exploring the bush and nearby sea. His father, Opanyan Kofi Nguyana Ngaloma, worked as a goldsmith in half Assini and was respected for his wisdom in traditional matters, but he did not live with the family. Kwame Krumah was the only child of his mother, Elizabeth Nyanaba, a fishmonger and trader, he attended an elementary school run by a Catholic mission in half Assini, proving to be a diligent student. A German Roman Catholic priest named George Fischer had a significant influence on his early education. Although his mother stated that he was born in 1912, Krumah himself claimed his birth date as September 21, 1909. At the age of about 16, he became a student teacher at the school and was baptized into the Catholic faith. Reverend Alec Garden Fraser, the principal of the government training college, later Achimota School, in Accra, noticed his potential and arranged for Krumah to train as a teacher there. Initially, he believed in cooperation between races to govern the Gold Coast, but he later embraced Garvey's belief in black self-governance for racial harmony. After obtaining his teaching certificate from the Prince of Wales College at Achimota in 1930, Krumah worked as a teacher in various schools and founded the Nzima Literary Society in Aksum, his encounter with Nigerian leader Namdi Azakai, who attended Lincoln University in the United States, influenced Krumah's interest in black nationalism. Krumah aspired to pursue higher education, and Azakai advised him to enroll at Lincoln University. To fund his journey in education, Krumah obtained support from his relatives. On his way to the United States, he learned about Italy's invasion of Ethiopia, which outraged him as one of the few independent African nations. Upon arriving in the United States in October 1935, Krumah faced financial difficulties and worked in menial jobs, including as a dishwasher, to make ends meet. He eventually secured a scholarship that covered his tuition at Lincoln University. During his time in America, he completed a Bachelor of Arts degree in Economics and Sociology in 1939, followed by a Bachelor of Theology degree from Lincoln in 1942. Additionally, he earned a Master of Arts degree in Philosophy and a Master of Science in Education from the University of Pennsylvania. Krumah spent his summers in Harlem, immersing himself in the vibrant black community and engaging in intellectual debates with street orators. These experiences further shaped his thinking and commitment to the African cause. The streets of Harlem became an essential part of his education, and he was influenced by influential speakers such as Arthur Reed and Ira Kemp, as well as Carlos Cook, the founder of the African Pioneer Movement, and Suji Abdul Hamid, a champion of Harlem labor. Krumah's ten years in the United States had a profound and lasting impact on his life shaping his ideologies and beliefs about the struggle for African independence. Armed with newfound knowledge and determination, he returned to the Gold Coast in 1947, where he would lead the fight for Ghana's independence and become a driving force in the decolonization of Africa. Kwame Krumah's legacy as a visionary and transformative leader continues to inspire generations in the pursuit of freedom, justice, and equality for all Africans. Kwame Krumah's activism and determination to achieve African independence continued to flourish during his time as a student in the United States. In Pennsylvania, he organized a group of African students, which evolved into the African Students Association of America and Canada, with Krumah serving as its president. While some members advocated for individual colonies to seek independence, Krumah advocated for a pan-African strategy, emphasizing the need for unity among African nations. In 1944, Krumah played a significant role in the Pan-African Conference held in New York. The conference urged the United States to support Africa's development and independence after the end of World War II. Krumah's commitment to the Pan-African cause led him to lead traditional prayers for his old teacher, Agri, in the U.S. in 1942, but this resulted in a break between him and Lincoln University. However, he later returned in 1951 to accept an honorary degree. Krumah's hunger for knowledge and experience drove him to further his education in London after the war. 
He enrolled at the London School of Economics and later at University College, with plans to write a dissertation on philosophy. Although his supervisor was not entirely impressed with his analytical skills, Krumah devoted most of his time to political organizing and activism. He played a crucial role in organizing the Fifth Pan-African Congress in Manchester in 1945, which laid out a strategy for African socialism and unity, seeking to dismantle colonialism. During his time in London, Krumah became the secretary of the West African National Secretariat WANS, and established the Colored Workers Association to help stranded West African seamen. He also founded the Circle, aiming to lead West Africa to independence and unity. The U.S. State Department and MI5 closely monitored Krumah and the WNS due to their perceived links with communism. In 1947, Krumah returned to the Gold Coast, Ghana, after the 1946 constitution granted Africans a majority in the Legislative Council for the first time. The newly formed United Gold Coast Convention UGCC, sought self-government, and Krumah was chosen to run the party due to his organizational skills. He accepted the position, despite the conservative leanings of the UGCC leadership, seeing it as an opportunity to further his political goals. Upon his return to the Gold Coast, Krumah wasted no time and began working at the UGCC's headquarters in Salt Pond. He submitted plans to expand the UGCC's branches across the colony and advocated for strikes if necessary to achieve political objectives, causing some division within the party's leadership. His tireless efforts to gain support and establish branches across the country showed his dedication to the cause of African independence, Kwame Krumah's experiences in the United States and the United Kingdom, coupled with his relentless activism, laid the foundation for his leadership in the fight for Ghana's independence and his role as a prominent figure in the decolonization movement in Africa. His unwavering commitment to Pan-Africanism and the empowerment of his fellow Africans would shape the course of history in the years to come, the Gold Coast, despite being politically more advanced than other British West Africa colonies, experienced significant discontent during the post-war period. Inflation had led to public anger over high prices, sparking a boycott of Arab-run stores in January 1948. Cocoa farmers were also frustrated with the colonial authorities for destroying trees affected by swollen shoot disease. Additionally, there were around 63,000 ex-servicemen in the Gold Coast who struggled to find employment and felt ignored by the government. In February 1948, a meeting was held by the ex-service men's union in Accra to address these grievances and plan a peaceful march to present a petition to the governor. However, the British responded with gunfire during the demonstration on February 28, triggering the 1948 Accra riots, which quickly spread throughout the country. The colonial government blamed the unrest on the United Gold Coast Convention UGCC, and six leaders, including Kwame Krumah and J. B. Dankwa, were arrested and imprisoned in Kumasi. The imprisonment led to a rift between Krumah and the other UGCC leaders, as they accused him of being responsible for the riots and their detention, Krumah's popularity surged despite his incarceration. He founded the Ghana National College with his own funds to campaign for the release of the arrested leaders. Although some UGCC members criticized his actions, Krumah's appeal to the masses grew stronger, particularly through his newspaper, the Accra Evening News. He also established the Committee on Youth Organization CYO, as a youth wing for the UGCC, which later broke away and became a vocal advocate for self-government now. In April 1949, under pressure from his supporters, Krumah decided to leave the UGCC and form his own party, the Convention People's Party CPP. The CPP adopted the red cockerel as its symbol, symbolizing leadership and masculinity, and the party's colors, red, white, and green, became prominent in various forms across the country. The CPP's message resonated with the masses, including underemployed youths from rural areas who joined mass rallies to demand freedom and self-governance. The British convened a commission, excluding Krumah, to draft a new constitution that offered limited self-government for Ghana. Seeing that it fell short of full dominion status, Krumah organized a positive action campaign to demand a constituent assembly to write a constitution. 
His call for a general strike led to violence, and he was arrested again, receiving a three-year prison sentence. Despite his imprisonment, the CPP secured a landslide victory in the February 1951 legislative election, becoming the dominant party in the colony. Upon his release from prison, Krumah was asked by the governor to form a government, and he became the leader of government business and later the prime minister. Krumah faced numerous challenges, but he worked to unite the four regions of the Gold Coast and prepare the country for independence. With support from the British and considerable financial reserves, he initiated a massive development plan, focusing on infrastructure, education, and modernization. Despite facing difficulties in producing enough graduates for the civil service, Krumah's policies and initiatives enjoyed broad support from the population. His leadership and vision played a pivotal role in shaping the path to Ghana's eventual independence, and his dedication to the country's development laid the groundwork for his future role as the first president of Ghana. After assuming the title of leader of government business in a cabinet chaired by Arden Clark, Krumah made quick progress, and in 1952, the governor withdrew from the cabinet, leaving Krumah as the prime minister with the portfolios that were previously reserved for expatriates now going to Africans. However, his administration faced accusations of corruption and nepotism as officials, following African customs, tried to benefit their extended families and tribes. The aftermath of the 1948 riots had led to recommendations for elected local government, a shift from the existing system dominated by chiefs. Although this proposal was initially uncontroversial, tensions arose when it became evident that the CPP would implement it. The CPP's majority in the Legislative Assembly allowed the passage of legislation that transferred power from the chiefs to the chairs of the councils. This resulted in some local rioting as new rates were imposed, while Krumah's retitling as Prime Minister did not grant him additional power, he sought constitutional reform that would pave the way for independence. In consultation with Colonial Secretary Oliver Littleton in 1952, it was indicated that Britain would favorably consider further advancements, provided that all stakeholders, including chiefs, had the opportunity to express their views. MI5, initially skeptical of Krumah's socialist policies, had gathered significant intelligence on him. And Krumah sought opinions on reform from councils and political parties in the country. In June 1953, a white paper proposing a new constitution was published, and it was accepted by both the Assembly and the British government. The new constitution, which came into force in April 1954, provided for an assembly with all members directly elected and an all-African cabinet responsible for internal governance. In the subsequent election, the CPP secured a substantial victory, with the Northern People's Party forming the official opposition, opposition groups, forming the National Liberation Movement, NLM, demanded a federal government for an independent Gold Coast, with an upper house where chiefs could counter the CPP majority. However, their demands were not met, and the Gold Coast was divided into five regions with power devolved from Accra. On March 6, 1957, Ghana gained independence, becoming the first of Britain's African colonies to achieve majority rule independence. The independence celebrations in Accra garnered global attention, with representatives from various nations and international organizations in attendance. Krumah, hailed as the Osajayafo or Redeemer, proclaimed that Ghana would be free forever. Under his leadership, Ghana adopted social democratic policies, establishing welfare systems, community programs, and schools to uplift the nation's development. To symbolize the new nation, Ghana adopted a flag with a black star, representing African freedom, and a coat of arms featuring eagles, a lion, and a St. George's cross with gold and gold trim. The country's new anthem, God Bless Our Homeland Ghana, was composed by Philip Biho. Krumah opened Black Star Square as a monument to the new nation, where national symbolism and patriotic rallies took place. Throughout his tenure, Krumah's commitment to Ghana's progress and development remained at the forefront of his leadership. Krumah's leadership of Ghana from 1957 to 1966 was marked by both progress and unrest among the people. Shortly after gaining independence, 
gonna face challenges, including deploying troops to Togoland to quell unrest following a disputed plebiscite and dealing with a bus strike in Accra driven by resentments among the GA people. To address regional divisions, Kruma enacted the Avoidance of Discrimination Act, which banned regional or tribal-based political parties. The United Party, formed by the opposition, expressed concern about Kruma's repressive actions and the introduction of the Preventive Detention Act, allowing for incarceration without charge or trial. In 1960, Kruma proposed a new constitution to establish Ghana as a republic with a president possessing broad executive and legislative powers. In the ensuing presidential election and plebiscite, Kruma was elected president over J. B. Dankwa, and Ghana remained part of the Commonwealth of Nations. Kruma also sought to eliminate tribalism, which he saw as a challenge to national unity. He passed legislation to prohibit racial or religious propaganda and attempted to ban tribal flags, aiming to foster a sense of national identity. However, these actions were met with criticism from opposition leader Kofi Abrifa Bija, who considered them repressive. During his tenure, Kruma worked to reduce the political influence of local chieftaincy, which had collaborated with British authorities during colonial rule. This strained relationship led to increased hostility between the CPP and the chiefs, leading some chiefs to favor the overthrow of Kruma and his party. As the power of the Convention People's Party CPP, increased, Kruma's government faced controversies such as the trial of three CPP members accused of plotting to harm Kruma, and the subsequent amendment of the Constitution to grant the President the power to remove judges. In 1964, Kruma proposed a constitutional amendment making the CPP the only legal party, effectively establishing a one-party state with Kruma as the President for life consolidating his presidency into a de facto legal dictatorship. Despite some positive accomplishments, Kruma's tenure was marred by repressive measures, political controversies, and the consolidation of power within the CPP. These factors ultimately contributed to growing dissent and opposition, leading to the end of Kruma's rule in 1966 when he was overthrown in a military coup. During Kruma's leadership, the civil service in Ghana experienced significant changes. In the period from 1952 to 1960, there was a process of Africanization, leading to more locals occupying positions. However, from 1960 to 1965, the number of expatriates rose again, with many coming from countries like the Soviet Union, Poland, Czechoslovakia, Yugoslavia, and Italy. Education was a priority for Kruma's government, and the CPP created the Accelerated Development Plan for Education in 1951. The plan aimed to provide universal primary education and laid the foundation for citizenship with literacy in both English and the local vernacular. Primary education became compulsory in 1962. Kruma also emphasized science education and the need for Ghanaians to actively participate in scientific and technological research. In 1961, Kruma established the Kwame Kruma Ideological Institute to train civil servants and promote Pan-Africanism. Education played a central role in the seven-year development plan for national reconstruction and development in 1964. With a focus on expanding secondary technical schools and industry-wide training schemes, Kruma was a strong advocate for Pan-Africanism and worked towards regional integration of the entire African continent. He promoted Ghanaian culture and heritage, oversaw the opening of the Ghana Museum, and established various cultural institutions, such as the Arts Council of Ghana, the Research Library on African Affairs, and the Ghana Film Corporation. In the realm of women's rights, Kruma's government made efforts to empower women politically. Special positions in parliament were designated for women, and some women attained prominent roles in the CPP Central Committee. Women were encouraged to pursue higher education and various professions. Breaking traditional barriers, Kruma's image was widely disseminated through various means, such as postage stamps and money, which led to accusations of a personality cult. Despite his efforts to promote education, culture, and pan-Africanism, Kruma's leadership also faced criticism and opposition, leading to his eventual downfall in a military coup in 1966. Under Kruma's leadership, 
the media landscape in Ghana saw significant changes. In 1957, Krumah established the Ghana News Agency GNA, to generate domestic and international news. The GNA expanded rapidly, with telegraph lines and stations in various cities worldwide. However, Kruma consolidated state control over newspapers, creating the Ghanaian Times and acquiring the Daily Graphic. He believed that the press should not remain in private hands and implemented pre-publication censorship of news starting in 1960, the Gold Coast Broadcasting Service evolved into the Ghana Broadcasting Corporation GBC, which featured television broadcasts with Krumah's appearances. He used this platform to announce national initiatives and programs. Krumah emphasized that television would prioritize education rather than cheap entertainment or commercialism. Krumah refused advertising in all media, seeking to maintain state control over information dissemination. He aimed to mobilize newspapers and journalists as collective organizers and educators in the quest for African independence and unity. Economically, Krumah focused on rapid industrialization to achieve true independence by reducing reliance on foreign capital and goods. He implemented development plans to expand manufacturing and create 600 factories producing various products. The Statutory Corporations Act brought major corporations under government direction. And Krumah's visits to socialist countries reinforced his belief in state control of the economy. During his time in office, Ghana experienced economic success with the expansion of industries like forestry, fishing, and cocoa production. Projects such as the Volta River Project, including the construction of the Akasambo Dam, aimed to provide electricity and support industrialization. However, Krumah's economic policies also led to regional tensions, increased taxes on cocoa farmers, and rising debt for the country. Krumah's initiatives in the energy sector included the Ghana Nuclear Reactor Project and the Ghana Atomic Energy Commission, laying the foundation for atomic energy facilities, Despite some early successes, fluctuations in cocoa prices and the government's appropriation of increased cocoa revenue caused tensions with farmers and alienated a significant support base for Kruma. In summary, Kruma's media policies aimed to consolidate state control and use media as a tool for education and mobilization. His economic policies prioritized industrialization and energy projects, although some decisions created challenges and regional tensions, Kwame Krumah's foreign and military policy during his presidency centered on promoting pan-Africanism and advocating for African unity and independence. He actively created international organizations to foster collaboration and solidarity among African nations. Notable initiatives included the First Conference of Independent States, the All-African People's Conference, and the All-African Trade Union Federation, among others. Ghana withdrew from colonial organizations, seeking to assert its sovereignty and independence. Kruma played a leading role in the Casablanca Group, which aimed to integrate Africa politically, economically, and militarily. He was instrumental in establishing the Organization of African Unity OAU, in 1963 and aspired to create a united military force, the African High Command, with Ghana taking a substantial leadership role. Krumah believed in the potential of the United Nations but criticized the control exerted by the great powers. Regarding economic matters, Krumah opposed African states' entry into the European Economic Community's common market and instead advocated for an African common market with a common currency area. He sought to exploit the Cold War rivalry between the United States and the Soviet Union to gain concessions and support for Ghana's development projects. In terms of armed forces, Krumah took control of the Royal West African Frontier Force, the Gold Coast Regiment, and established the Ghanaian Air Force and Navy. The Ghanaian military budget saw significant increases during his tenure. Ghanaian troops were deployed to Congo to join a United Nations force during the Congo crisis, and they also provided military support to rebels fighting against Ian Smith's government in Rhodesia. Overall, Krumah's foreign and military policy aimed to strengthen African unity, assert Ghana's independence, and position the country as a leading voice in the Pan-African movement. He believed that through collective action and solidarity, African nations could overcome colonial legacies and achieve genuine independence and development. 
Kwame Krumah's relationship with the communist world was marked by his strong alignment with the Soviet Union and the People's Republic of China. In 1961, Krumah embarked on a tour through Eastern Europe, declaring solidarity with the communist nations and even adopting the Chinese-style Mao suit as his clothing attire. As a result of his pro-communist stance, Krumah was awarded the Lenin Peace Prize by the Soviet Union in 1962, further solidifying his position as a champion of socialist ideals. However, Krumah's close ties with the communist world, particularly the Soviet Union, raised concerns among some factions, both within Ghana and abroad. His increasing alignment with socialist ideologies and economic policies led to criticism from Western powers, particularly the United States, which perceived him as a threat to their interests in Africa. In February 1966, while Krumah was on a state visit to North Vietnam and China, his government was overthrown in a violent coup d'état orchestrated by the national military and police forces, with support from the civil service. The coup, led by Joseph Arthur Ankara, resulted in the establishment of the National Liberation Council, which ruled as a military government for the next three years. Krumah did not learn about the coup until he arrived in China. He subsequently went into exile in Conakry, Guinea, where President Ahmed Seko Touré made him honorary co-president of the country. Despite his retirement from public office, Krumah continued to advocate for his vision of African unity. During his time in exile, Krumah lived in fear of abduction and assassination, suspecting foreign intelligence agencies of monitoring his activities. He eventually sought medical treatment in Romania but passed away in April 1972 due to prostate cancer. Krumah's legacy as a key figure in African independence and unity remained significant. He was posthumously voted African Man of the Millennium by listeners to the BBC World Service in 2000, recognized as a hero of independence and an international symbol of freedom. His vision of African unity and socialism, though met with challenges during his lifetime, continues to influence the political discourse in the region, Kwame Krumah became a symbol of black liberation in the United States. In 1958, at an event in his honor organized by the Harlem Lawyers Association, diplomat Ralph Bunch praised Krumah's leadership as Prime Minister of Ghana and his representation of African hopes, ideals, and dignity. In his 1961 speech, I Speak of Freedom, Krumah highlighted Africa's vast resources and called for independence from European rule, envisioning a flourishing Africa contributing positively to the world. His powerful words rallied the nation in a nationalistic movement towards freedom and a brighter future for Africa.